Well, good afternoon and welcome to our natural living workshop with herbal, herbologist Lily Cunning. Lily is going to be presenting on um, growing herbs for personal wellness. And um, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, mm. everybody is muted, but you are welcome to either use the chat box or unmute and ask the question. Um, we just ask that you remute yourself um, if you come off mute, just so um, that really gives everybody the opportunity to hear Lily very clearly. And let me hit my screen share here, Lily. And um, <clears throat> thank you, Lily. And I believe, does everybody see the Growing Herbs for Personal Wellness? No, you're not seeing that? Okay. I see it. All right, so that tells me I need to do this screen. I was practicing earlier on, but it, obviously it didn't work. How about now? Mm -hmm. Good, perfect. Thank you, Lily. <clears throat> sure. So yeah, so um, today uh, today's topic is near and dear to my heart um, because herbalism, uh, which is you know what I practice, um, is the people's medicine and it should be accessible and affordable to all and uh if you can grow your own medicine for wellness um you know you're you're in a much better position to deal with all kinds of maladies not just cancer but you know the pandemic that we're dealing with and regular old cold and flu season um you know any kind of condition that you may have um, and so one of the goals that I have for this particular workshop is for everybody to learn about a handful of herbs that can help them with specific issues that they may have and start that garden this year. Um, a lot of people are familiar with gardening for edibles, um, but we'll also talk a lot about how adding herbs into your garden this year can not only help with your overall wellness, but it can also increase your yields for fruits and vegetables as well. So um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so in order to figure out how to plan your medicinal garden, you need to know what grows here in Ohio um, and also specifically on the plot that you have. So some people are blessed with a nice, big, sunny plot. Some people have to grow in containers on a patio. Um, some folks have a lot of shade or they have like a swampy area in their yard. So we need to know not only what grows in our USDA zone, but also in our specific plot of land. And then we're gonna assess what sorts of needs you and yours have um, and we're gonna go by herbal action. Um, it's how I teach my beginning herbal students, um, you know, to learn about what uh, physiology is affected and how in the body by certain herbs. So a lot of people are familiar with the term like antiviral or anti-inflammatory. Those are actions that herbs can have in the body. And we're gonna be talking about those um, and some plants that would help with those particular issues. And then we're gonna talk about maybe, maybe you already have the idea that you're gonna grow tomatoes and peppers this year like me. Um, and what edibles have I already planned for and where would those herbs go uh, in relation to the edibles that you're already growing for maximum benefit, um, which is known as companion planting. Um, and we're going to talk about the different benefits of companion planting. Um, and if you're familiar at all, you'll know that a lot of these herbs that I'm going to be talking about, which are medicine in their own right, also help benefit, you know, the, the food that you want to grow. Next slide. All right. So we've got two USDA zones here in Ohio, although climate change is, is making things a little funky lately. Um, but zones 6A and 6B um, are what the USDA has defined uh, in Ohio. Um, I think we'll find as we go along that our climate is going to become here in Ohio much more temperate, um, kind of like the climate that I moved from to move to Ohio, which is uh, California. 
um, as climate change changes things. We've already noticed strange weather patterns and I think that that will continue. But in the meantime, I live in zone 6A. I did when I lived in Columbus and I do now that I live out on the farm in Madison County. I'm not sure where everyone is zooming in from, but um, <clears throat> there are two zones. And so make a note of your zone because that's gonna tell you <clears throat> um, first frost and last frost dates, which are gonna be important to know about when to put things into the ground and when to make sure you harvest by, um, as well as what plants would do okay with the conditions that we have in terms of climate. Obviously, we're not gonna be growing any citrus here anytime soon. Uh, next slide. So, um, and there are things that we can grow here that wouldn't normally grow here. Things like aloe vera, which is a tropical uh, plant that does well in temperate to hot zones, but we can grow it as a house plant and control those conditions. Um, bay laurel, which you know people know as bay leaves, um, that's a tree um, or a, a shrubby kind of tree. Um, it can be a patio plant that you grow outside and bring it indoors. And there's lots of reasons to grow bay laurel, not just food reasons, but also to help you with fermentation and to help you with pest control and to help you with headaches, all kinds of good stuff. So here in Ohio, we can treat uh, herbs as an annual, even if they're technically perennials that grow in different zones. We can replant them year after year, or you can bring them inside or into a greenhouse uh, in order to preserve their, their life. Um, you know, I've never had much luck in basil inside after the season's over. I get great basil during the growing season, but uh, when I bring it inside, it, it doesn't seem to like it as much. Maybe I need to add like some external heat or light. Um, I haven't bothered to do that in the past, although now I have like little heating pads to sprout seedlings and I have grow lights and stuff for in between to, to do my seed starts. Um, but yeah, basically think about what you wanna grow and then you can kind of adapt to your environment somewhat to grow things that might not be the happiest here. Next slide. So let's think about uh, medicinal needs that you and your family have. Um, so <clears throat> there are herbs that can help with pain and inflammation. There are calming and sedating herbs, and this can be good for not only getting to sleep, but also if you're an anxious person and you just need to turn down the volume of your anxiety. If you've got seasonal allergies, antihistamine herbs would obviously be a friend of yours. I tend to get them in the spring and the fall when the seasons change. Um, so I use antihistamine herbs quite a lot. Um, antimicrobial, so that could be antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, depending on what's going on with you. Sometimes, you know, pharmaceuticals can have um, unintended consequences, like antibiotics can cause fungus and yeast overgrowth. So maybe you need to balance that if you are required to take antibiotics. <clears throat> Things that boost the immune system, uh, we, we do have those. And you know, depending on where you are in cancer treatment, you may also want to think about immune modulating herbs. So maybe not boosting your immune system um, and, and ramp, ramping it up, but having your immune system make some better choices um, is something that you could do even if you were on immune suppressants like uh, people with autoimmune disease are. Um, adaptogens, if you don't know what those are yet, you're going to be super excited by the end of this uh, presentation because adaptogens are a whole class of herbs that are safe for everyone, that help uh, fortify the adrenals, which help us cope with stress and change and illness and all kinds of things. And usually they have a second system that they have an affinity to other than just the adrenal glands. Um, so some of them are, you know, uh, fortifying the adrenals and also stabilizing blood sugar. Sometimes they are fortifying the adrenals and helping the immune system uh, make better choices. There's a lot of different kinds of adaptogens um, out there. And 
there's an adaptogen out there for everybody and it really just helps you feel so much better, particularly when the sky is this color. I'm looking out my office window and it is just grayish white, no sun to be seen. Um, yeah, adaptogens. Um, digestive herbs, also known as carminatives, um, help if you have funky digestion, if you have acid reflux, gas and bloating, diarrhea, constipation, if these are chronic things for you, whether it's you haven't figured out the root cause or maybe you know the root cause, digestives can help you cope with those adverse symptoms. Uh, you could also have emotional support herbs. Um, you know, if you've got, you're going through grief or you have depression, um, or anxiety, um, emotional support herbs can be very useful. Um, if you're accident prone, or maybe you have a condition that requires a lot of um, soft tissue repair, there are herbs that help facilitate faster healing of muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, cartilage, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and respiratory is a huge class of herbs here in Ohio. I was really surprised at um, the rates at which people get asthma and other related issues here in Ohio. So when I first opened my little shop, um, I started out with a respiratory shelf that was a single shelf and it soon expanded to a double shelf. Um, so respiratory is, is a big class of herbs that a lot of people need here. Cardiac issues, if you've got um, cardiovascular issues and you need strengthening, there are herbs for that. Nervous system disorders, so you know, um, things like Parkinson's or MS, things that affect the nervous system. Um, there are herbs that help with that. And women's reproductive health, whether that is uh, people of childbearing years or menopausal years, there are herbs that help with all kinds of women's reproductive health. So what I would like y'all to do, just so that I make sure that I customize this, um, this uh, class to the people attending is in the chat window, write down some of the things that you think you might need herbs for, whether that's like, I get headaches or, oh yeah, I want an antihistamine or um, you know any number of things. And that way I can make sure that I talk about herbs that are specific to the people who are attending. Um, so next slide. Or maybe we should keep it on here for a minute in case, uh, yeah, in case people need to refer to the list as they're typing, maybe give them a minute or so. Um, but, you know, I personally use, like I said, I use antihistamine herbs in the spring and in the fall um, because I get upper respiratory congestion and sneezing and, and I end up using a neti pod as well just because my body really likes to make mucus, it's gross. Um, but I also use adaptogens uh, at different times of the year. Um, I make uh, a formula called digestive bitters that helps my uh, overall digestive system process food and um, you know assimilate nutrients and it also deals with any sort of gas and bloating. Um, and I don't really have respiratory issues, but I do have pain and inflammation. Um, I have a partial disability that I am constantly getting body work for uh, to sort of, you know, free up my fascia and things like that. And I have pain and inflammation when I do more stuff. And now that I have a farm, I'm doing more stuff. <laughs> so I definitely need those. Um, all right. So I see inflammation and pain. I see calming emotional cardiac antihistamine. Allergy symptoms like crazy this winter. Yeah, I know, I know. I've been using my neti pot more this winter than I usually do. Emotional adaptogens, menopause, neuropathy, fibromyalgia. Oh yeah. And yes, um, I've already uh, emailed Darlene handouts and a PDF of this slideshow. So you will be getting it if you are in attendance. So that's good. Um, okay, we'll go on to the next slide. So 
Um, let's think also about what edibles you're already planning if you are. And I'm assuming kind of if you're attending this that you're already thinking about gardening. So you probably have already said like, oh yeah, I want some of those heirloom tomatoes or oh, I'm gonna grow some chilies or whatever it is. So think about those things because we're gonna get into a little bit uh, of companion planting, just some general guidelines. And I'm gonna be giving you much more detailed handouts that will cover a lot more than I could in an hour. Um, yeah. All right, so next slide. Oh, and aren't those raised beds really pretty? They're woven uh, branches. They're like willow raised beds. I just think they're so pretty. Anyway. Next one. So the benefits of companion planting. Um, plants that need more shade get some shelter from taller ones. That could be one way that you do companion planting or support plants that climb can climb higher ones. You can also draw beneficial insects in with certain plants or repel uh, pesky insects that, you know, like tomato hornworm or uh, cabbage moth, you can repel those by companion planting. It also can improve the quality of your soil. Um, a lot of people know about composting and, you know, ameliorating your soil that way, but you can also do it through uh, what you plant in the garden year after year. You can also plant some decoy plants so that if you've got a really bad pest problem, they're gonna take your decoys rather than, you know, the thing that you covet the most. And the picture here is what's called the Three Sisters. So this is um, uh, a Native American Southwest uh, America method of companion planting that has really taken hold for folks that like to grow these three uh, native crops. So corn grows nice and tall and it provides a trellis for your beans. And the squash is planted around the corn because it stamps out any uh, weeds that may be uh, taking over resources because uh, it spreads out and, and is wide and covers the soil. So it provides a ground cover for the other important crops that you wanna maintain. And the three of them provide nourishment for each other, which is great. Um, the beans add a lot of nitrogen to the soil so that when you're done with your growing season and you're plowing things back under or you're you know, folding things in or letting them rot under the snow, um, you're not depleting the soil the way that a lot of commercial agriculture does. So this is a really nice method if you like growing different kinds of squashes and beans and corn. This year I think I'm going to try uh, the glass gem corn. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the pictures of those, but it looks like stained glass. They're just the most beautiful ears of corn. If you've never seen it, Google it. They're beautiful. Um, anyway, next. So I, I did, went over this a little bit in the previous slide. So, you know, companion planting ideas and, and the handouts that I give you are really going to um, help inspire you to figure out what you want to plant next to each other because only you know what your total uh, plants are that you're going to grow. Um, so plants that prefer similar conditions, obviously those make sense to plant together. Um, you know, if you wanna maximize your garden space, let's say you have a small amount of space, plant the fast growers with the slow growers because what's gonna happen is the fast growers will max out and you'll be able to harvest as the slow growers are taking up more space. Um, you also wanna keep plants that are prone to similar diseases away from each other because all you're doing is creating a, a focus for that particular plague. Um, so you wanna keep them on opposite ends of the garden. Um, taller plants, like I said, can provide shade. So if you've got a really tall sunflower, grow lettuces underneath it, because lettuces don't like direct sun, they like shade. Um, you know, and you can separate plants that impede each other's growth, which, you know, could mean zucchini all by itself somewhere because zucchini just kind of takes over an entire garden. I planted one zucchini plant last year and we, there was more zucchini than my family could eat and it just spread. It was crazy. Um, let's see. And uh, yeah, plant to improve the soil for future crops. 
one of the things that I did um, this year is I got a huge bag of red clover seeds. Now, a lot of people, a lot of commercial farmers plant red clover when they're doing crop rotation and they've got a field that's going to be fallow. They'll just strew a bunch of red clover there and then, you know, turn it over because it fixes nitrogen in the soil. Well, Yes, I want to do that, uh, especially since I'm converting the farm around me uh, from commercial agriculture into something more sustainable. But also, red clover is a medicinal. Like, I use that in my formulas. So having a field of red clover, that sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, so improving the soil. <clears throat> Next slide. So let's think about what grows in your specific plot. I want you to think about certain variables. Um, how much sun do you get in a day and how much shade do you have? And <clears throat> the, um, the amount of space that you have with direct full sun, partial sun and shade so that that will help you determine what crops you wanna grow. You wanna maximize um, your area. You also wanna think about what kind of trees grow on your property. So a lot of people here know that, you know, if you've got a black walnut tree, a lot, not a lot will grow around the black walnut tree. And that's because trees are the bosses of an environment, right? They, they kind of rule the plant kingdom. And so the trees, through the chemicals that they send out in the soil, determine what kind of plants are gonna do okay around them. And that goes for all trees, um, not just black walnuts. So um, one of the books that I highly recommend, if you're looking to sort of do more of a permaculture method and really uh, garden in tune with what's already on your land, um, there is a book, I think it's Mark Shepard, um, it's called Restoration Agriculture, and it's all about uh, permaculture and how to start that project, but there's a whole chapter on what trees do you have, and are you going to be planting around those trees, and if so, um, what kinds, what families of plants do okay around those trees. Again, that book is called Restoration Agriculture, and I believe it's Mark Shepard uh, is the author, and it's fantastic. It's, it's one of the books that I really recommend for people just getting into this and really feeling like, okay, I wanna do this in a more sustainable way. Um, so that's something to consider, the trees on your property. Think about how much moisture and rainfall you get, um, as well as how much moisture you wanna add you know, um, how, what, how much your water bill is going to be, um, or do you have uh, rain barrels in place to catch rain so that you can, uh, you know, grow uh, all different kinds of things. You know, some things need more moisture than others. Um, they're more resource heavy crops. And if your area um, isn't set up to grow certain things that require a lot of water, Deciding to grow that thing is fine, but know that you are making a commitment to use a lot of water and to, you know, have a system set up, either soaker hoses or sprinklers or getting out there with a can every day uh, and watering. You also want to know when your last frost is. <laughs> so when I moved to Ohio from California, first of all, I was astonished. I didn't really think about it. Um, you know, we grow year round. We just grow different things all year round. But uh, when I moved here, I was like, I can't put plants in the ground until after Mother's Day. To me, I was like, how does anyone grow anything around here? That season's too short. Um, so you, you, you learn some tricks. Uh, first of all, knowing when your last frost is, when you can safely put something in the ground, because it's super sad to, to have a seedling and put it in the ground and then lose it because you were premature in getting it in the ground. So um, know when that date is and you can look at these things online or in an almanac um, or on the USDA website, um, but knowing when that is. Um, and what things do you already grow um, and, and grow well in your plot? Because that's also gonna help you figure out what else would grow well. Because you know plants exist in families and they have commonalities in terms of what conditions they like. So if you're able to grow things in the mint family really easily, then that not only means mint, but that means lemon balm and catnip and all kinds of good stuff. 
So um, <clears throat> figuring that stuff out. What is next? Yeah, so I talked about the trees. Oh yeah, see it is Mark Shepard. Yay, I win. Um, Mark Shepard, restoration agriculture. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, instead of fighting constantly, you know, you want this plan and it never does well, well, you may find out that the trees on your property just don't want to let it do well. So you have two choices there. You can either submit <laughs> to reality and be like, okay, I can't grow that. Or, 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 you make it a container plant or a plant in a raised bed. And that way the soil that is impacted by the tree roots are not part of the equation, right? Means more work either on the front end um, or more work on the back end, meaning, you know, ripping out plants that didn't do well. So think about that when you're, when you're deciding what to plant. Next thing. Oops. Herbs for shady places. Um, so let's take a, a moment to pause here and I'm going to make a list for you of herbs by action. Um, things that I know grow well in both zones in Ohio um, for different purposes. And, um, you know, this is going to be recorded. So if you are writing furiously and I'm going too fast for you, no worries. This will be available to you in the future. But uh, let's start with pain and inflammation because it seems like most of you need herbs for pain and inflammation. And so the thing that I would say uh, in terms of growing well here. Meadow sweet uh, is a lovely herb that um, is high in what we call salicylic acid. It's one of the plants that we use when we were first creating aspirin. You know, now pharmaceuticals like that are synthesized, but uh, the salicylic acid exists in plants. I mean, that's where uh, it comes from. So meadow sweet is a really great plant that grows here in Ohio and is a great anti-inflammatory and, and pain reliever. Chamomile, a lot of people take chamomile for granted because they've been drinking chamomile tea for a long time, but probably they're not drinking really potent fresh chamomile. They're probably getting the little bags from the supermarket and who knows how old they are and how long they've been chopped up into little pieces that fit into a bag. But fresh chamomile is, <clears throat> first of all, it tastes very different uh, than the stuff in the bags from the supermarket. And second of all, it's much more potent than you would imagine. Not only uh, does it have sedating qualities because some people drink chamomile tea to help them get to sleep, but it's also anti-inflammatory um, and it helps relieve pain. Uh, another one that grows like a weed and most people consider a, a nuisance plant that is one of the best anti-inflammatories I know of is stinging nettle. So stinging nettle uh, grows pretty tall and it has these little tiny hairs on it, on the stems and on the leaves that will sting you if you touch it. Um, and those, those barbs, those little hairs are actually, they contain the, the anti-inflammatory uh, in the plant. So when you cook it, those things go away. Um, so I recommend doing cold brew teas or tinctures of stinging nettles. Um, to, to help with inflammation. And our ancestors knew that this plant was really valuable. And while the, the sting will create like a rash on most people's skin, um, the amount of inflammation that is reduced by uh, touching is pretty astounding. And so people would take uh, stalks of stinging nettle and they would... Um, whip themselves with it in a place that was really swollen. Like if you had gout or uh, rheumatoid arthritis and your joints were really swollen, uh, people would you know, flagellate that area and the swelling would just completely decrease. Yeah, you'd have a rash, but uh, it was probably less painful than the amount of inflammation if you were willing to do that. Um, so stinging nettle is a really great anti-inflammatory. Mullen, um, the flowers of mullen, they're beautiful little flowers that grow on a big tall stalk. Those are big anti-inflammatories and I use those for like earache oil. Uh, California poppy, 
which uh, is in the opioid family, but it's not addictive like opium poppy is, uh, is a really great pain reliever, as is wild lettuce. And wild lettuce, a lot of people don't know what that looks like, but it's probably growing in your yard and you had no idea. It kind of looks like the way dandelion leaves are. They're that sharp scalloped kind of thing, but they're pricklier. And when you um, break a leaf, there's a milky sap. That milky sap is um, a pain reliever and an anti-inflammatory. And I tincture wild lettuce and put it in formulas all the time. Um, let's see. Hot pepper. If you like spicy foods, eat those spicy foods um, because your inflammation is gradually lowered as you keep the capsaicin from that those hot peppers in your body. Um, I like spicy foods, so I eat it regularly. And I also like not just hot spicy, but other spices. Those also bring down inflammation like turmeric and ginger and um, cardamom and cinnamon. All of those warming herbs that enhance your circulation also bring down inflammation. So I drink golden milk. I put it in my coffee every morning. I had some this morning. Golden milk is like turmeric. The way I make it is turmeric, ginger, and black pepper and honey and then I mix it with a, a milk. So sometimes I mix it with dairy milk and sometimes I mix it with coconut milk, but the turmeric is fat soluble. So it kind of enhances uh, its absorption. But all of those things are anti-inflammatory. Um, let's see, I know people mentioned antihistamines, uh, stinging nettles again. Uh, those, those little hairs are also antihistamine. And I take stinging nettle in a tincture all the time when I'm, you know, when I've got the, the head congestion and the allergy symptoms, stinging nettle is your friend. Um, and it's like the main herb that I put in my allergy tincture. Um, so uh, thyme, which people mostly use as a culinary herb, let me tell you, thyme is my very favorite herb in the world because not only is it antihistamine, but it's also broad spectrum antimicrobial. So I extract it into vinegar and I use it as a cleaning for surfaces to, to get rid of germs. Um, I also put it in all my food, especially in the winter when you know we're all breathing recycled air. Um, but yeah, time is my favorite and it tastes good on everything. So um, let's see, Eyebright is another antihistamine as is Ma Huang. Uh, in fact, Ma Huang is my favorite decongestant and antihistamine. It is illegal to sell, but it is totally legal to grow for your own personal consumption. Um, back in like, I want to say the early 2000s or late 90s, the government banned Ma Huang, which uh, is ephedra sinensis. So people know about ephedra. Um, athletes were abusing it. Um, and so they just banned it instead of allowing it with caveats or whatever. Uh, but I grow Ma Huang. It kind of looks like, if you know what horsetail looks like with the little segments, it grows like that, but kind of like a spider plant. Um, and uh, I just take little tubes of it and make a tea when I'm feeling really super congested. Um, and when you grow your own, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, somebody not being able to sell it to you anymore because you have it. Um, adaptogens. So good adaptogens that grow here. My favorite one and the easiest one to grow is Tulsi, which is also known as holy basil. Um, it tastes delicious. It's good in all teas. Um, and it has the benefit of not only fortifying your adrenals, but also stabilizing blood sugar for those of you that have um, blood sugar issues, diabetes, or um, hypoglycemia. It works for both. It kind of modulates, helps you stabilize that um, glucose level in the blood. Um, and then the other one, the other two that grow pretty well here, but there are roots. So you need to like make an investment into growing them long-term is astragalus, which is also good for illness season. So astragalus is really fantastic right now for COVID, for cold and flu season, um, for people that are prone to like um, bronchitis during cold weather, they get, they're prone to getting bronchitis. Astragalus is great. You use the root though. So what you need to do is commit to growing it um, 
throughout the years and then start taking some after year two. The same goes for ashwagandha. Um, I'm growing ashwagandha right now. I'm in my office, so uh, I don't have it near me or I'd show you what it looks like. Um, but ashwagandha, I think, is the herb for our times because it helps with anxiety, depression, stress, um, and insomnia. Like, who doesn't need ashwagandha <laughs> at this point, uh, especially with the pandemic going on? Um, so I love ashwagandha and I grow it as well. And it grew really well this last year. The last year was the one that, and I planted it in a container and it's really stabilized itself. I'm gonna have to transplant it for this year when I put it out back on the porch. Um, let's see. I know we had, oh, menopausal symptoms. So there is an herb that, <clears throat> uh, so there's a couple herbs that are really great for helping balance the hormonal dips and spikes of menopause. Um, Cause the adverse symptoms that we get uh, happen when we get spikes and dips, not because we're losing estrogen. If we just gradually waned down, we wouldn't necessarily notice but you know, our body is like doing it in fits and starts and that can cause hot flashes and night sweats and mood swings and irritability and all those wonderful things that come along with menopause. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple herbs that work really well for this. The first one is a bush that grows really well here, the chaste berry bush, um, also known as Vitex agnus castus. Um, and it, we use the berries on that. So every year you can, um, you know, get berries and the berries are, um, a modulator. They help regulate, um, the amount of estrogen in the body. So it's a long-term strategy for your short-term strategy while you're waiting for the Vitex to work, because it'll work within weeks. And the most optimum benefit you'll see is at the end of three months, you'll see you're completely balanced. Um, but while you're waiting for that to work, uh, black cohosh is actually a native here to Ohio. It is a perennial root that likes to grow in shade in the forest. So it is actually endangered uh, because people are short-sighted and they don't think about harvesting uh, sustainably. So when you look for black cohosh, you want to source from a company that you know sources ethically um, and either cultivates it themselves or it is ethically wild crafted. Um, but uh, that one works by binding to estrogen receptors and tricking your body into thinking you actually have more estrogen than you really do. Um, and so that can alleviate some symptoms temporarily. Um, so yeah, those two herbs are fantastic for that. If you've got uterus kind of issues, either excessive cramping or heavy bleeding or, um, you know, PCOS or whatnot, red raspberry leaf, the leaf, obviously the fruit is delicious, but the leaf uh, is the thing that you want to take. Um, and ladies mantle is another herb that you can uh, grow here that is fantastic for hormonal balancing issues for, for women. Um, Lily, um, you've mentioned a lot of wonderful names. Um, and I, along with several participants, are worried about the spelling. The handouts that you have given me to forward on to participants, will these be listed in there? Like the um, ashtagandha? I have no idea how to spell that. <laughs> Yes, um, yes, um, those herbs are in the handout. And of course, if for some reason I mention an herb and it isn't in the handout, and I've done this, this particular um, presentation a few times, so I think they're all up to date. Um, but uh, if not, you can always email me, um, lilycunning at gmail.com. I'm happy to answer any questions after uh, a thing, but I have a whole bunch of handouts for y'all um, where, It'll list, you know, the actions and then herbs that grow well here in Ohio um, that will do that for you. Um, let's see. I remember there was some cardiac and some digestive in there. So cardiac, um, you may already have in your area a hawthorn tree. Um, so there are lots of different kinds of thorns that grow here in Ohio, but hawthorn is 
sort of Western herbalism's cardiac supreme herb. And we use the berries of the hawthorn tree. So they're really easy to get. Um, you just wait until uh, after it flowers and, and collect berries. Um, but also motherwort. And motherwort is super easy to grow in any garden. In fact, it'll take over. So you got to keep an eye on the motherwort. Um, and that one is really great to help regulate um, heartbeat. So if it, whether you've got tachycardia or bradycardia, fast or slow, heartbeat and it's or irregular, it just helps keep everything nice and steady. So folks that you know may be looking at getting a pacemaker, taking a motherwort tea or a motherwort tincture on the regular may actually avert that crisis. Um, let's see, digestive. So chamomile is another one. So if you've got an upset tummy in, in any way, chamomile is just great to take. But all the mints, any kind of mint at all is gonna be great for your digestion. And that includes catnip and, and lemon balm, like I mentioned before. Um, but all the mints, all the basils, all of the basils, and those are all delicious. Um, you know, violet is also a really great digestive and a lot of people have, you know, little violets growing in the spring. Collect those. Um, a lot of people don't know that violets and dandelions and plantain, which kind of looks like a spinach leaf, but it has stripes through it, grows in the cracks of the sidewalk, grows everywhere in your yard. Um, those three herbs are not native. They were brought here by Europeans because they're so dang useful. Um, so yeah, collect those because uh, every part of those plants is useful. Um, to, to do, to do, let's see. And Lily, um, should we worry about any side effects of any of these herbs? So there are some herbs on the list that may, um, <clears throat> because they've been so amazing at doing what they do, they've been studied a lot um, and have some of the same actions as pharmaceuticals. And so if you're on certain pharmaceuticals, you may want to avoid things like St. John's wort. Um, <clears throat> if you have uh, a specific question about that, it's hard for me to get really granular in these one hour classes. But what I can do is you can send me an email and say, these are my medicines. These are the herbs that I'm thinking about growing. Are they okay? And I'm happy to answer those questions at any time. Um, <clears throat> Cause yeah, it just depends on what you're taking um, and uh, what treatments you're undergoing. So yeah, that's the one off the top of my head that I can think of like, oh yeah, that one, you, you don't want to be on antidepressants, for example, and take St. John's wort because St. John's wort works in many ways like antidepressants and you don't want to go too far down one way. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of herbs that you can um, take safely. Uh, it just depends on your individual circumstances and I'm happy to answer those questions for folks. Again, my email is lily, L-I-L-Y, cunning, K-U-N-N-I-N-G, at gmail.com. Um, and maybe Darlene, when you uh, send out the handouts, you can just put that in there. So Absolutely. That so people can ask me questions because I'm happy to do that. I, <clears throat> you know, I consult with individuals all the time on their specific health stuff. Um, so respiratory, mullen again comes up, um, the leaves this time for lung support. So if you've got breathing issues, whether it's asthma or COPD or chronic bronchitis, or you've got a, a lung illness, mullen is going to be your friend. Um, I grow it. <clears throat> because there's so much respiratory stuff here. We need a lot of mullen. Um, I also uh, grow what's called elecampain um, inula, and it has a really pretty yellow flower, but the root is really great at um, strengthening the bronchi, uh, which is super important when you've got compromised respiratory issues. Um, and mahuang comes up again. It's also a lung support herb. Um, in terms of anxiety and nervous system stuff um, or stress and sleep, um, uh-oh, we're seeing all kinds of, whoop, there we go, Darlene. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of nervous system things, if you are looking for something to help you 
uh, with cortisol spikes and uh, stress and stuff, but you don't want it to sedate you. I can think of two. Um, so oats, yes, the same oats that you know you make oatmeal out of. Um, if you get fresh oats, um, you can tincture it or make it into a tea. Um, and those are helping to make the nervous system function better. It's a nervine tonic. Also, if you have a nervous system condition like Parkinson's or MS, um, the nervous, uh, the nervine tonics can help you. And then the other one I can think of is skull cap. Um, and it's named after the shape of its little flower. It looks like a little bonnet. Um, and skull cap is also a really great nervine to help people. Um, if you're looking for something that does sedate you, let's say maybe you're too anxious or you're having a hard time getting to sleep, um, <clears throat> passion flower is a great one. Chamomile is also sedating. Uh, lavender uh, is really lovely. Um, California poppy, um, catnip, yeah. And lemon balm. Lemon balm is my favorite, actually. Lemon balm is my favorite Nervine sedative. It's cheerful, but it's also sedating. And it's also a really potent antiviral. Um, if you have any virus that you need to put in remission, things that we live with indefinitely, like herpes, cold sores, or um, shingles, uh, lemon balm is your friend. And it grows like crazy here. You, you plant lemon balm and it will take over. Not only does it taste delicious, it tastes lemony um, and it grows really easy, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's a powerful antiviral and a great Nervine sedative for when you need it. Did I miss anything? I'm like looking through my list here. Oh, antimicrobial, right? Antimicrobial. Um, so depending on what you need, uh, you know, there's antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals. Uh, like I said, my favorite is thyme. It kills all of it. Um, but lemon balm is a, an antiviral. Um, yarrow grows really well here. And I would get the wild type yarrow that has the white flowers. Um, but it is a really great um, antimicrobial, the flowers and the leaves also have styptic properties. So let's say someone you love is on blood thinners um, and, you know, uh, maybe they cut themselves shaving or they, you know, cut their hand while they're chopping food. It just won't stop bleeding, you know, because uh, of those blood thinners. Yarrow, you take yarrow leaves, it will stop the bleeding and it also treats for any infections. So it's, it's better than a Band-Aid. Um, what else? Uh, echinacea. So um, echinacea purpurea grows here as a native wildflower. I was in the, um, <clears throat> there's a couple parks here in, Ohio, in central Ohio that have um, Darby Plains restoration going on. There's one that never stopped being the Darby Plains, but it's like the size of a postage stamp. And then there are ones that have been reconstructed with Darby Plains plants. <clears throat> um, Echinacea purpurea is one of those plants. It used to be all over central Ohio and now it's just, you know, in limited into beds, but it's a beautiful plant, purple cone flower, um, and it's <clears throat> antimicrobial and it also boosts the immune system. Elderberry is another one that's a favorite. So elderberries taste delicious. And uh, you can do all kinds of food and medicine applications with elderberries. It's immune boosting, it's antiviral, and the elder flowers, if you decide to take the flowers and not let them all go to berries, the flowers are respiratory support. Lily, um, we have a question in the chat. Where can they um, either uh, get either plants or seeds to grow Tulsi? Yeah. So at the end of the presentation, I'm going to tell you about the annual seedling sale that I have for a nonprofit. Uh, we actually take pre-orders um, and that money goes to uh, preserve folkways and herbal medicine through a nonprofit I have called Sassafras. Um, and also uh, it benefits Herbalists Without Borders. Um, I'm planting a bunch of rows for them to distribute in their free clinics. So um, yeah, I have a, a, a whole form that you can fill out to get either seeds or seedlings uh, in time for planting. 
Um, and then I'll also give you another link um, for a medicinal seedling nursery in Oregon that you can mail order seeds or seedlings from as well. Um, so that one's called strictlymedicinals.com. And then um, on my website, lilycunning.com, there's a seed and seedling order form and they're inexpensive. I think most of the seedlings are $5, so they're already started. And I think seed packets are four. Um, and you will see so many more herbs than I'm even talking about. You'll probably spend some time going down a click hole. You'll be like, what's that one? And you'll look it up. Um, but yeah, there's, there's hundreds of herbs that you can get either seeds or seedlings, uh, this year. One of the missions of Sassafras, which is the nonprofit I started, is to preserve this, this legacy of holistic healing and folk ways and ways of, um, uh, you know, making sure that people have access to what they need to, uh, maintain their own wellness and their own health. So yes, lilycunning.com, and then you can go to the seedling page or strictlymedicinals.com, um, and they have a whole catalog as, uh, there as well. Um, did I miss any body systems? I can't, um, I'm looking here and I've skipped around, so now I'm lost. Um, did, I, did I address everyone's like, needs in their family. If, you, if I didn't say, I need you to talk about this in the chat. Let me see, let's see two things in the chat. Where can I get seeds to grow Tulsi side effects? No, I think maybe I got it all. Oh, wait, oh, uh, draw out splinters. Um, so there is a native root that grows here. It is endangered. Um, but if you grew it yourself, um, then you can kind of use it as you need to. Um, it's called blood root and, um, uh, you can grow it here. It's a perennial root. You probably won't want to take any, uh, until it's the plants at least two years old, but you can take some of the root and then extract it in oil and apply that oil to an area to draw things out. Most drawing salves use blood root. Um, but yeah, it's a native to Ohio here. We're, let me tell you, we in Ohio are blessed. Like I told you, I was mad when I moved here because the growing season is so short, but, um, I had no idea that I was moving to such a botanically wealthy place. We have so much that grows here natively. Um, it's incredible. Like I went to um, an herbalist weekend with one of the people that I look up to, Matthew Wood, and he was here. He lives in Wisconsin, like further north, and he was here and he was teaching and he took us out on a plant walk and he just kept going, oh my gosh, this grows here? Like every five feet, he would be like, oh, and that, and that, and that, and they were all natives. Like, he's like, you guys are lucky. <laughs> So there's a lot that grows here. It's pretty astounding. Um, swelling and edema. Oh, um, so I was talking about inflammation, which is when things are swollen, uh, it's part of your inflammation response. Your body sort of brings fluid to an area uh, because there's something going on in that area that the immune system thinks it needs to deal with. Now, in the case of autoimmune diseases, that's a bummer because it swells up like the joints in the case of rheumatoid arthritis when it's just your body attacking your own body. It's not really because of a pathogen or whatever. Um, so stinging nettles was something that people used in order to bring down that swelling. Now, if you used it topically, you know, and like whipped the area with a branch of, of stinging nettles, it would cause a rash and it would be a little uncomfortable. It kind of tingles and is weird, um, but it brings down that swelling like crazy. You can also, um, you know, buy a tincture or a salve that contains stinging nettles and you're not going to get that rash part of it because the constituents are in there, but you're not going to get the barbs causing the rash. Um, okay, eczema, I see eczema. So eczema tends to be a symptom of a larger issue. And what I have found, um, so first off, many people don't know the difference between eczema, 
contact dermatitis, and psoriasis. And so um, eczema tends to be sort of this blanket diagnosis put out by dermatologists, whether or not, um, like I I've seen people that have diagnosis of eczema, that they have a dry scaly rash patches that bleed when you scratch them. And I've seen people with an eczema diagnosis with a wet weeping kind of thing. And you would look at them and go, why are these both the same thing? Well, um, eczema tends to be a skin reaction to internal allergies, usually dietary. And the main reason people have eczema outbreaks is they continue to eat something that their body does not like. And the main culprit, especially here in the Midwest, tends to be dairy products. Um, there are things that you can grow that will help with eczema breakouts. Um, let's say you have, go to a pizza party um, and then you have an eczema outbreak. Uh, you'll, you'll see it. I recommend quitting dairy for three months. Three months, I know that's hard. Three months uh, in order to see, because that's about how long it takes for the skin to actually reflect changes in the diet. Um, but you can use things like calendula, which grows really well here, uh, chamomile, which grows really well here, um, and comfrey, which also grows really well here to deal with eczema patches, uh, regardless of the type. Um, if you have the dry kind, I would also add something like burdock root, which also grows really well here. My dog came in uh, trying to get underneath the fence into the pasture and there was an old burdock plant there and he was completely covered in burrs, poor guy. Um, burdock definitely grows here. Um, I would add that to the dry scaly kind um, because it's a moistening herb. For the prostate, um, there aren't a ton of plants other than stinging nettles that grow natively here, but you can also um, get herbs uh, from different distributors like saw palmetto, um, but that's more of a tropical tree berry. So, but those do really well for um, helping enlarged prostates and painful prostates. Um, I see a question here, Raisin Rock and Banyan Botanicals. So, um, Raisin Rack is a local uh, shop and I know that they have a bulk section. I have not looked at their bulk section to see how old the herbs are. The thing about buying bulk herbs is that you want to go to a place that has good rotation of the herbs and they're selling enough of it that they're not just sitting around getting old. So I don't know about Raisin Rack. I do know that um, Clintonville Natural Foods, which is on Indianola and Clintonville, they seem to do a pretty brisk bulk um, selling. Um, so I know about them. Uh, Banyan Botanicals are Ayurvedic herbs. So um, I'm a Western herbalist, but I do use some herbs that, are, that come from Ayurveda or Chinese medicine. Um, so the thing that I will note about Banyan Botanicals and I have bought from them before is they tend to only sell powdered herbs. And I'm not a huge fan of buying things powdered unless you're going to use it right away. Um, and unless they powder it right before they send it to you because powdering, let's think about plants. Uh, they contain these constituents that are the medicine and they contain them within the plant cell walls. And when you chop up a plant super fine and powder it, you basically are degrading those cell walls. So those constituents oxidize and they start deteriorating. So unless you know how old the powder is, um, I wouldn't go for powder. I would go for nice vital chunks. And then if you need to powder it, you can powder it yourself right before you use it. Like if you were going to put them in capsules or something, I'm not a big fan of capsules either. Um, I like extracts <laughs> uh, because they extract the constituents from the plant at their peak potency and then they're preserved in the liquid for a long time. But that's my personal preference. Well, um, we, we did have somebody ask about neuropathy. What would you recommend for neuropathy? So yeah, so you're going to want both nervine tonics and nervine sedatives. So a nervine tonic or things that I mentioned like oats or uh, skull cap, and you can take those every day and keep them in your system. Um, and then you're gonna want some nervine sedation, meaning shutting down those constant signals of pain um, from your nerves. Uh, 
And those are like lemon balm or chamomile or um, let's see, uh, catnip, hops, all of those things. And there's a Nervine sedative for everyone. Like if one doesn't work for you, it's not that Nervine sedatives don't work. It's that that one didn't match your biochemistry just yet. So I recommend playing around with different Nervine sedatives and the handout that I gave you will give you a whole bunch of options to try. Um, and then I also, uh, neuropathy and fibromyalgia, things that are um, <sighs> painful, I would recommend St. John's wort if you can take it, depending on what pharmaceuticals you're on, because that helps with neurotransmitter support, works on the neurotransmitters. MS people really benefit from St. John's wort. Um, and then, uh, what was the other one? Oh, uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, regularly taking like a tonic grade anti-inflammatory because they're thinking that fibromyalgia isn't really about the nerves anymore. They think it's about the blood vessels and inflammation of the blood vessels. So I would start, you know, maybe drinking golden milk every day or, you know, doing a, um, a tea every day of anti-inflammatories like meadow sweet. Did you move the page because you're telling me to move on? Is that what is going on? <laughs> well, we are at 103, so I wanted to see what oh, the no. page okay. was. Sorry, <laughs> I can go on forever. Um, all right, so uh, edibles and herbs are a winning combination. So I have this here um, to show you that if you have um, basil in with your hot peppers, you're going to boost the flavor of both of them and you're going to repel pests. Like there's so many different benefits to companion planting, um, depending on what kind of thing you need to do, whether it's a specific pest you're trying to get rid of or you're trying to improve the flavor. One thing that um, isn't on here with tomatoes, I plant yarrow near my tomatoes every year because yarrow enhances the flavor of the plants around it. So if you want delicious slicing tomatoes, you know, so you can make your tomato sandwich like I do every lunch time during the summer, you know, plant some yarrow near your tomatoes. It's gonna bring out all of that amazing flavor. Um, and you'll have yarrow, which is always a really good herb to have on hand. Next slide, since I'm running behind. That's your last one. That's my last one? Oh, okay, great. Um, so I hope that um, y'all got a little taste of what is possible uh, with growing herbs and I'm happy to answer any questions. Definitely check out all the handouts that I sent to Darlene. And if you have any individualized questions, please email me, you're not bothering me. I would love to do that uh, and help you. Um, also, you know, check out the either strictlymedicinals.com or uh, lilycunning.com for the seedling sale. I'm going to be taking pre-orders and then um, going down to Athens to a nursery down there to pick them up the last Saturday in April. So you've got some time to kind of plan your garden and figure it all out, um, but definitely get your order in because I'll invoice people and then uh, paid invoices will go into the order pool and I'll pick up your stuff and bring it back to Central Ohio. What is my daily routine? Oh, <laughs> uh, I take care of animals on the farm. I take care of plants on the farm. Uh, I do work for Haven Herbs uh, multiple days a week. Um, I do a lot of different things. Um, so it just depends. Yeah. No, I meant your daily, wait, your, your ingestion. Because oh, so many things. It's like, <laughs> oh, go broke, buy. If, if you can't grow it, if you have to buy it. That's what I meant. Right. Like daily, what do you do? Pretty much. Right. Well, that's when you start growing because honestly, yeah. nobody can afford what people charge for supplements. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, I grow a lot of what I need, but also, um, I take, uh, right now I'm taking extra vitamin D because not only is it this time of year for vitamin D, but um, all the people that have really very uh, intense COVID cases are deficient in vitamin D. So How many milligrams? take your vitamin D, um, at least 5,000 IU a day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, currently every other day I'm taking 10,000. Whoa. Um, 
I know it's big. They used to think that that would be a toxic dose. It is not. Um, so I take vitamin D and um, I do some things for my uh, joint fluid and my cartilage because my knees are not the best anymore.